Now, I put a, a word um, in the title that may be new to some people. Uh, it's a word that you pronounce, it's spelled H-E-N-D-I-A-D-Y-S, indiatus, indiatus. What does that mean? What is an indiatus? Well, it's a literary form or a, a literary term that uses certain words to describe, let me say it this way. It uses two words to describe one thing. Two words to describe one thing. And um, it's, a, it's a literary method that is employed in the Bible. So when you go to study hermeneutics or study biblical interpretation, there's certain phrases that were used, or let me say it this way, the Hebrew, uh, the Greek, and the Latin would use this, this, this form of putting two words together to describe one thing. An example in scripture, when it says it rained fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, it's not referring to two things. Really, it's referring to one thing. It was, it was burning sulfur. One thing, burning sulfur fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah, where the scripture says fire and brimstone. Now, I'll explain to you why this, this literary form is used, fire and brimstone or burning sulfur. Uh, sometimes in the Hebrew and Greek, their, their use of adjectives was not like we use in English. So they would use two nouns to describe one thing. Here's another one. John the Baptist came in the power and authority of Elijah. It's really referring to one thing, uh, or rather the power and spirit of Elijah. Uh, one way of saying it, he would come in the powerful spirit of Elijah. But it uses two words, power and spirit of Elijah. It's not referring to two things. It's one thing using two words. That's the way the Hebrew and the Greeks would use these, this, this literary device called an indiatus, H-E-N-D-I-A-D-Y-S. Look it up, write it down. Now, everyone doesn't have to do this. If you, if you, if, if, if you don't want to study this, it's not necessary uh, but if you want to really get into the literary style of certain scriptures, because scriptures um, can be difficult to understand in some places because of the fact that we're reading ancient texts that were translated from ancient documents. And their their literary style was a lot different from what is employed today. You know, there's, there's apocalyptic literature um, there's metaphorical, allegorical things that are used in scriptures. There are idioms that are used that may not, we may not understand fully. We're going to look at heaven and earth in this way today. Heaven and earth being, being uh, in the form of an indictus. H-E-N-D-I-A-D-Y-S, an indictus, and, and what that represents. And I'll explain it even more detail what an indictus is. And you can type it in, or you can type in, if you want to Google it, type in indictus in the Bible and do a study. There's some articles that will come up that will show you. Some of them are very in-depth, may even be overwhelming. You may not have time to go into it in depth, but it will give you some shorter ones where you can study this particular subject. We've been talking about heaven and earth, and um, the word heaven and earth also, we're going to look at it today can represent something complete or something that's full. So when it says heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word should not pass away, it's, it's not necessarily referring to two things, heaven and earth. It's referring to one system passing away completely. One thing passing away completely. When it says a new heaven and a new earth, it's not necessarily saying two new things. It's one thing. Uh, becoming new. Jesus, the Bible says in Revelation, I make all things new. It refers to all things or one thing, but it's described as heaven and earth. It's using two words and in diatus to describe one thing. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take my time and, and just go through this with you. And then we're going to look at some scriptures on heaven and earth. 
And again, share the broadcast. I know this is somewhat theological, and um, sometimes I get into these veins of teaching that are theological that everyone may not enjoy. You know, people love prophecy, encouragement. Give me a short word. I understand that. I'm not here to try to make everyone a theologian, even though I do believe you should study to show yourself approved unto God. I'm not trying to make everyone go into depth in certain theological terms. That's not my purpose here. Um, because sometimes people just say, just give me a word, man, to get me through the week. Just help me. I, I don't need all this in dietist and all this theological stuff. But there are some people that do like it and you can benefit from it. And we always try to make sure of how this is applicable to your life today. We're not just doing this to be theological or to be intellectual or try to impress someone with theological terms. We're doing this to study, to get revelation, understanding of scriptures, to understand them better and how they apply to our lives today. So I'll take a little time doing that. We're going to look at some heaven and earth scriptures that show you that heaven and earth also represents something that's full and complete the fullness and completion of a thing. So that's what this term can also mean in scripture. Okay, passing away of heaven and earth, something completely passing away. New heaven and new earth, something completely new arriving. Okay, one thing described in two words. So let me, let me, let me define this word in Didis to you. H-E-N-D-I-A-D-Y-S. Write it down, look it up is a rhetorical device in which two words, typically nouns or adjectives, are used together to express a single complex idea. Two words put together to express a single or complex idea. Instead of a, a one word modifying the other, as in a standard adjective noun combination, the two words are joined by conjunction, the word and, to emphasize the concept more forcefully. For example, in the phrase nice and warm, we say the, the place is nice and warm. Instead of saying nicely warm, the use of an endiatus, endiatus emphasizes the pleasantness and warmth separately, but collectively embraces the overall idea. Uh, and that is, are often used to create a more, listen to this now, and that is, are often used to create a more vivid or dramatic effect in speech or writing. So the, the, the reason to do that, power and uh, the power and spirit of Elijah, fire and brimstone. Okay, it gives a more vivid, even though it's talking about one thing, the powerful spirit of Elijah or burning sulfur. Um, it gives a more vivid and dramatic effect in speech and writing, emphasizing the two elements of the idea equally. The device is frequently found in literature, particularly in works of Shakespeare and in biblical texts. So let's look at the Indictus of heaven and earth. Indictus is a rhetorical device where two words typically connected by a conjunction are used to express a single united concept. In biblical literature, the phrase heaven and earth is prime example of Enditis, conveying the idea of, an in, of, of the entire created order or all things. This expression is used throughout scripture to emphasize the totality of God's creation and his sovereignty over all. Now here's some examples. Ephesians 3.15 of, of whom the entire family in heaven and earth derives its name. Now we know there's only one family. But it described the family in heaven and earth. But it's one family. In this passage Paul is emphasizing the, universe, the universality of of God's fatherhood, the phrase heaven and earth, he, he here uses uh, in Didis to underscore that all of creation, both the spiritual uh, heaven and earth, the saints find their origin in God, 
The phrase highlights the comprehensive nature of God's dominion and care, suggesting that everything in, in, in existence, whether seen or unseen, owes its existence and identity to him. Heaven and earth, the saints in heaven that you can't see, the saints on earth that you can see, one family, Ephesians 3 and verse number 5. Acts 17, 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, in it, the Lord of heaven and earth. So when it says the Lord of heaven and earth, it refers to one thing, all of creation. He created all things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. Sometimes we look at heavens and earth as two separate things, and they can be two separate things, but when they're put together in an indictus, it represents one thing, the entire, the fullness of what God created. Uh, Matthew 5, 18. Again, for I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota or, or dot will pass from the law. Now, I shared this, that in that, in that connection, Matthew 5, 18, that the passing away of heaven and earth is connected to the fulfillment of the law. When the law would be fulfilled, heaven and earth can then pass away. Now, I shared that heaven and earth in that context can refer to the entire old covenant system passing away, being removed. For instance, in the book, when it says heaven is rolled up like a scroll and the earth is removed out of its place, it can refer to a nation. Isaiah 13, the judgment upon Babylon is described as the heavens being rolled together as a scroll and the earth being moved out of its place. But it's referring to one nation, one kingdom, Babylon. Babylon would be removed as a kingdom. The entire kingdom would be judged. And so when it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, it's referring not to two things, a new heaven, a new earth. It's referring to something new coming, the fullness of it. The old heaven and earth passes away. It's removed. The scripture says it, it will wax old as a garment, uh, become obsolete. Hebrews chapter one, Hebrews chapter eight and verse 13, which in the context Hebrews is describing the superiority of the new covenant to the old covenant. It's describing two covenants, one being removed, waxing old like a garment. Jesus said you cannot put a, a new piece of cloth on an old garment the old garment referring to old, the old system of the law, the temple, the system, the covenant, old covenant. And so that's being removed. The entire thing, not a part of it, the entire thing. All the law has been fulfilled. We're not under it anymore. Not a part of it, but all of it. And remember that when we talk about heaven and earth being removed, it will be removed with fire and judgment. It would come. And it would be completely removed, but a new heaven. Now, new heaven and earth is described in Isaiah 65. I create a new heaven and a new earth as behold, I create Jerusalem, a rejoicing and her people a joy. So the new heaven and new earth, according to Isaiah 65, is the new city, the new people. I create Jerusalem, a rejoicing, her people of joy. So it's talking about a new Jerusalem. And we see in, in, in Hebrews 12 and 22, you've come unto Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. It's the spiritual city, the heavenly city, the one family in heaven and earth. Heavenly saints and earthly saints are connected to one city, the new Jerusalem. So it's referring to one family, uh, one covenant, the new covenant, one system. I make all things new, all things have become new. So heaven and earth can be used to describe something that's complete, something that's entire, something that represents one system. In this case, the old covenant system, the law, its sacrifices, the priesthood, the temple, the old city, it will pass away as, as what it was under the old covenant. And a completely new thing would come in its entirety with salvation, righteousness, glory, God's presence. Uh, it would come and it's described as a new heaven and new earth. Now let's look at a few more verses 
that really, I believe, bring this out uh, even more fully. Let me let me let me change um, my my notes here. See if I can bring up these scriptures that um, I collected. Um, give me just a moment. Um, uh, what wait, wait in Ephesians? Let me give you the, the, the scripture. Ephesians chapter four. I, I do know it. I, I want to read it to you. But Ephesians chapter four talks about uh, the fact that Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth. And then he ascended to heaven that he might feel all things. So when we talk about heaven and earth, there's even another realm called under the earth, under the earth, which is, I guess, a part of the earth. But there, of course, is under the earth. Jesus descended to the lower parts of the earth. Why did Jesus descend into the lower parts of the earth? And then he came back up and ascended to heaven that he, the scripture says that he might feel all things. So Christ filled heaven and earth by going even to the lower parts of the earth. He filled it. It's referring to his authority, his power, him fully being Lord over the entire realm of heaven and earth, the entire realm. So that's what heaven and earth can represent. In that case, it says he descended to the lower parts of the earth. He came to earth from heaven, came to earth, but then when he died, he went to the lower parts of the earth. Now, some use the scripture in Peter where it says he preached to the spirits in prison because at that time under the earth, there was paradise, Abraham's bosom and the fire of hell. We see that when Jesus, when the, when the rich man asked for a, a drop of cold water that he put on his tongue and Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, that was under the earth. Then we know that when Jesus ascended, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He evidently took the saints that were waiting on him in paradise under the earth and took them to heaven. He filled all things, heaven and earth. And so another scripture that's interesting uh, is in Revelation uh, chapter number five. I believe it's chapter five, verse 13. It says that all creatures in heaven and earth and under the earth and under the sea gave glory and praise to God. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean that people living under the waters? <laughs> no, it doesn't. It's just a literary way of saying all creation, all creation. And it doesn't mean whales and fish giving glory to God because creatures in the Bible represents humanity. I preach the gospel to every creature. We don't preach the gospel to animals, but we preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're creatures or we're created by God. So it's, it's a word that's used to describe humans. But there are no humans living under the oceans, under the waters. I know there's some people that believe that, but they're not. When it says all those in heaven, all creatures in heaven, in earth, under the earth and under the sea gave praise to God and glory to God. It's, it's a literary term or a literary way of saying all, all of God's people gave him praise and glory for his judgments that are happening in the book of Revelation. It, it's just a literary way of, of making it more vivid, making it more forceful, you know, language is very powerful and we use language in different ways. For instance, when, when, when God told Abraham that in multiplying, I will multiply you. He uses the word multiply and multiplying twice in the word. He could have just said, I will multiply you, Abraham. But he says in multiplying, I will multiply you. Because that, that emphasizes the word multiply. It gives it more force. It gives it more power. It gives it more emphasis. So when you're reading the Bible, there are many literary terms and, and phrases that are used for emphasis. 
And it's, it's really, an, the Bible is really an amazing book. Even its literary style from the Greek and Hebrew is really amazing. When you understand linguistics and literary styles, um, you understand words can be used symbolically, allegorically, metaphorically, literally. They can be used double. Here's another one. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you. Now, he could have said, verily, I say unto you, but he says, verily, verily. He uses the word verily twice. Why? To emphasize, truly, truly. This is true. Truly, truly, I say unto you. There's an emphasis on the word truly by using it twice in the verse. Now, I, I love words. I, I study words because I use words. I'm a preacher. I'm a teacher. So words are what I need to convey a message. That's why I love the study of words and different literary devices. And I've studied the Bible, the different literary ways. If you're not, if you're not familiar with these terms, this way of, 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 of the way they spoke when they said heaven and earth shall pass away, that's the complete thing is going to move away. It's not necessarily referring to the heavens and the earth, two things passing away, one thing. It's an, it's an indictus. Two words are used to describe one thing to give it more force, more power. Um, and so Jesus, it mentioned, goes into the lower parts of the earth, he, heaven, he, he, has, he has ascends, descends, and ascends that he might feel all things. Complete, complete lordship, complete rule, complete power. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. That means I, I have dominion over all. Heaven and earth is used in that term to, to imply I have dominion over all. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and preach the gospel. It's a literary device to emphasize all. all every creature in heaven, earth, even goes further. Under the earth and under the sea, give praise to God. Well, it's just a literary term to show that all of God's people, all of God's people, in this case, I believe it's the new creation, new creatures, are to give God praise and to worship him because of his amazing judgments found uh, in the book of Revelation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, try. I have, I have two documents I'm working from that I, I did notes on. And I'm, I'm going to try to um, bring up uh, some more on these particular uh, verses that are primary. Here's, 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 here's a, uh, let, let's talk about indictus again. Most languages, including English, have a construction called an indictus. Here are some examples. We say day and night. Day and night. That means continually all the time. We use two words to describe all the time. Okay, he was he preaches day and night. Um, um, they're here day and night. Was just using day and night to describe all the time. Okay, I, I search high and low. It means I looked everywhere. I search high and low, time and again. That means repeatedly. Neither one nor the other. You really neither one or the other means nothing. Okay. Turn neither to the right or to the left. Do not deviate from the current path. For better or worse. That's said at many marriage ceremonies. It's an indictus in English. Under all circumstances. Ancient Hebrew and Greek has similar expressions. Heaven and earth, all things. Ephesians 3.15, Acts 17.24, Matthew 5.18, Psalms 121 to Ezra 5, 11. Um, and so they're neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. No distinction. This is a triple indictus. No distinction. Male or female, slave or free, um, Jew or Greek. It's, it's an indictus that represents all. No, no distinction. That's Galatians 3 and verse number 28. And so uh, the use of indictus in the phrase heaven and earth across these biblical passages serves to highlight the complete 
comprehensive scope of God's authority, power, and creative work. It unites the spiritual and physical realms in a single concept, stressing that God's dominion is absolute and all-encompassing. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. That means he's the Lord of everything. It's, a, it's two words used to describe one thing. He's the Lord. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He's the creator of everything. A new heaven and new earth. I make all things new. Revelation chapter 21. Heaven and earth shall pass away. That entire, all that entire system will pass away. Uh, but it could not until all the law was fulfilled. Um, Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. I have it all. He ascended into the, descended into the lower parts of the earth and then he ascended to heaven, heaven and earth, that he might feel all things, that he might have dominion over all things. Now, how does this, how does all this theological talk apply to us spiritually? Well, it gives us a revelation of the comprehensive nature of our salvation. All things are new. New creatures, new creation. He makes all things new. Um, it's comprehensive. It's full. It's, it's complete. Um, we walk in the completeness of salvation. His power, his authority is complete. Um, he, he has a name above every name in heaven and earth. His name. Here's another example. In the book of Revelation, there was no one found in heaven and earth that was worthy to open the book and to loose the seals until Jesus came as a lamb to unloose the seals and open the book. There was no one worthy in heaven and earth, which means there was no one they could find anywhere in all of creation that was worthy to open the book. But he uses heaven and earth as an hendidus uh, to describe one group of people, all people. And he uses that to make it more vivid, make it more forceful, make it more impactful. Now, sometimes in the prophetic, and we're going to talk about this in our upcoming webinar um, this month on prophetic sounds, prophets and prophetic people, God can give you certain words and have you put together words and the purpose of putting together those words are, are to have more impact and force in the prophetic release. Where we use words and learning how to use them by the spirit and what they represent um, is an amazing, amazing tool that gives us the ability to impact and speak with force and power in ways than just using simple terms. Okay, these are things that we learn as we study uh, the scriptures uh, and study this and die this. Okay, so copy the word down. Look it up. You don't have to. If you don't want to go deep, say this is too much. I ain't in all this. Just give me a word that's going to get me through. No problem. But I know there's some students that love studying with me and I love you. You're joining me and studying with me. Again, share the broadcast. Share today's broadcast and uh, put it on your page and uh, we'll continue this theme of heaven and earth in the days to come even more. Don't forget TV to register for the upcoming Master of the Prophetic, Prophetic Sounds. The date is August the 28th, uh, Wednesday night. Uh, those who join me for the monthly teaching, you can register at johneckhart.tv. johneckhart.tv. We're going to continue this discussion in Clubhouse. We'll, we'll go off of Facebook Live now. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for contributing as well. Until tomorrow, as we continue this study on heaven and earth, until tomorrow, to hear from me again, God bless you and double shalom. God bless.